welcome to today's second Reiki Roundtable. We dive into Reiki and I'm super excited. I have some wonderful ladies with me. So I have Andrea Deyerlen, I have Parita Shah and Christine René. They all have amazing practices and a great approach to having a Reiki business, which is the subject we're talking today. So I'm going to try to contain myself and actually allow the ladies to bring all the magic. So I will start with Christine. You're actually to my left today. So we're starting then Parita and then Andrea, if you can introduce so people know a little bit more about you. Absolutely. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for hosting us. I'm Christine Renee. I am in Bozeman, Montana and have an international online Reiki Cafe University as my business. I Gosh, I started years ago. I've been practicing now for Reiki um, 20 years, which is half my age. And my father was doing Reiki when I was a kid. And so it was when I became an adult, the, the thing that I was like, yes, I want to learn that. <laughs> so um, started teaching about 13 years ago and really started my full-time business about six years ago. So it's been an amazing journey. And Really excited to be here with you ladies to really explore our commonalities, our differences, and how we have it approached this topic. I'm, I'm really excited. It's going to be great. Thank you so much. And I'm always so jealous that you grew up with parents who did Reiki. I'm like, I, I can't. I, it's going to be like, I'm going to die, and I'm still going to be jealous about that one. Forget it. <laughs> well, and now it's like he took he took his level two back in the 1980s and then I reattuned him and now I'm his Reiki master so <laughs> I love it beautiful Farita how was your journey like home when did you start and then how did you become a business yeah thank you again for having me um I've been practicing for about six years now um, I got into Reiki with some health uh, challenges that I was facing, and they started about 10 years ago. And so uh, a couple years in, I was just looking for ways to cope and manage the stress um, of, you know, having some misdiagnosis or not being able to find a treatment plan, I'm just having a lot of challenges with um, accepting my body or getting to know it. Um, and so Reiki was definitely helping in coping with that and just gave me all the tools. Um, I, I learned like emotional intelligence and mindfulness through that. And um, I, I noticed that it was slowly, but making, um, but subtly making changes for me. And so I wanted to share that with others. And so I've been practicing in um, New York City, Long Island and virtually um, and a little combination of those for the last like four years now. And um, I had the pleasure of taking Reiki 3 with you, Natalie. So um, uh, yeah, and right now I just focus on um, some Reiki trainings, some online courses, some sessions, and, um, and I write a blog. Thanks, thank you. And it was a pleasure to practice together for sure. Andrea, you've been my partner in crime on many Reiki circles online through the pandemic. So tell us a little bit about you. Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Andrea Dierlein. I am located in uh, White Plains, New York, and I uh, my business is called Thrive Reiki. I have my own practice. Um, so we are in my practice now, um, 300 square feet, and um, I am very, very grateful. Um, I never intended to be a Reiki practitioner. Um, it just, you know, Reiki found me and then my business just developed out of this. And um, my work focuses mostly on uh, mindfulness and the mind-body connection to really support my clients um, to be self-empowered. That's why um, Thrive is actually an acronym that stands for transformation, healing, relaxation, integrity, values, and empowerment. And I feel very passionate about the credibility of Reiki because I work with a lot of um, stressed out professionals. And these people often come with a very, um, you know, distorted perception of Reiki or they've never heard of Reiki at all. So this is why I'm very, very careful of, of how to communicate Reiki, not to scare people away and to make it more inclusive. I love that. And I met Andrea probably when she had just finished uh, your master with Francine. We met, we met at a play date. 
And so that was probably also five, six years ago. Time is flying. So ladies, I'm so grateful you're like giving me your time and sharing everything. I wanted to start with that moment when you were like, I love Reiki, this is helping me so much to, okay, I'm setting up the business. And a little bit like, okay, that moment, what was the first thing or what was your first business idea as well? So I'm gonna change order. Whoever wants to go first, uh, go first or raise the hand. Sure, um, for me, it was definitely a process over a couple of years. Um, I had uh, been studying finance in college and um, I was first at one university. Um, I was away from home and um, because I had some health challenges, I had to uh, leave and come back home. Um, and it was like a like a hard process of like letting that identity you know down. Um, I, I wanted to stick with you know that that university, stay with that um, um, role in finance. I thought that's what I wanted to do. I thought that's what would make me happy. And I I, I didn't really have an understanding of what my purpose was. Um, but over a couple of years. I went to another university. I again studied finance, um, but when I, and I always thought I would just heal my health challenges and then continue that route. Um, but after a few years, I was still dealing with some other health challenges. And um, and I when I graduated, I realized that I just don't have it in me to work a typical like 40 to 50 hours a week. Like my body is not designed for that. And um, and so it was a slow process where, you know, I started working part time for my family's businesses. Um, but during this time, my Reiki practice was also growing personally. And um, there, there just became more and more motivation in me to want to help people that are going through similar things that I was. Um, I wanted to help people cope with stress. And um, of course, it, it, you know, in the beginning, I just didn't think that you could make a living as a Reiki practitioner. I, I, I didn't really know anyone in my family that was um, not working the typical nine to five or they would have a business, but it was not a spiritual practice. I mean, so um, it, it took me quite a, a while to realize that, no, this is a path that I can do and I'm meant to do it and being called to do it. So I have to like, give it a try. Yeah, I feel like I have a similar story in that I had a lot of health issues come up for me as well and realize like, I can't, I can't work <laughs> like normal people can work. So I, um, I had originally started my Reiki practice training at a birth center. I was training to be a midwife and I was doing, you know, four to five births a month. I had a baby at the time. So I had a toddler and uh, from my first marriage, I had a lot of emotional abuse still coming from that. And um, just a lot of drama, like a lot of drama, like high anxiety, high stressed out state. And I actually ended up hitting my, um, my really my bottom. Like I had extreme anxiety. I was in despair with my um, custody battle with my first husband. And um, I, there came a point where I just said, I can't do this anymore. I gave up custody temporarily. I decided I quit my job, my nine to five job on the spot. And I said, I'm not going to do anything unless it's meditation and Reiki based. Like, that's just it. I just hit that wall and said, okay, I'm taking the time that I need to heal myself, however long that takes. And then it eventually within a year, it became a practice that I wanted to offer to others to help them guide them through their own healing journeys. And so when I started my practice, I didn't know what I was doing. I think I'm, when you start out, you don't get a manual on how to start your Reiki business. So I, um, I lived in a small town. I still do. Um, at the time it was like 35,000 people and in a red state. And so I was like, we'll see what happens. And my goal, what really was, I want to have enough income from this to pay, cover rent and couple, cover the childcare expenses for me being here. 
let's just start with that. So I had really low expectations in the start and um, began by offering guided meditations as well. And, and that really was able to build my clientele from that. So it was, it wasn't a, okay, I'm starting a business. It was like, okay, this is just the next step. This is just the next thing, the next right thing to do. And, um, I eventually was able to build that practice up so that it was, it was my full-time work and I, I didn't need to have any other income. It was so it, it beautifully blossomed. And I'm one of those slow and steady will get you there type people. Like, um, I don't want to rush it and burn out. I'm like, I'm going to do this with my autoimmune. I'm going to do this with my family home life. I want to do this in balance and have it organically grow and build a foundation that's going to be sustaining for the next 20 plus years. I love that slow and steady, which is probably the what we don't do most often when we launch the business, right? We're expecting to make a living after one month or two months. So I think that's great advice. Andrea, how was your story? <laughs> My story developed, you know, so it's a personal journey and then I just wanted to learn more and part of my um, first master training in the Western tradition, it was that we needed to give in-person sessions. You know, I think it was 40 or 60 hours or um, and, and I had to rent a room so in order to give those sessions and so when I rented that room and just just who I am I'm just like okay you know what I have to do this correctly so I have to make sure you know I have insurance so this is how my first venture in the business first started so how do I get the insurance what kind of insurance and that wasn't easy to figure this out um, then it was just like the legalities right so I started working with an attorney and actually I have an attorney on my team it's just like client intake forms you know what is the correct wording because I just want to make Make sure that I'm on the safe side. So in the beginning, I just rented the room for one day a week. You know, I remember it well. It was $50 a day. It was $200 a month because nobody knew me and I was just starting out. Um, I had to walk dogs, other people's dogs to, <laughs> to pay the rent. <laughs> because I was just like, I don't want to go into save into my savings. I don't want to ask, you know, I, I just like, I want to do this by myself. And, you know, through this, and then because I have a background in marketing and communications, and it was just like, okay, how do I get people um, to practice on? So um, I just started to play a little bit with social media, build a website. And um, then um, I got invited at the local library to talk about Reiki. And that became very popular. And I think for two to three years, I did monthly um, programs. Um, um, and that, that helped me tremendously um, to know how to communicate Reiki, how to work with people, what people were looking for, kind of building also credibility within the community. And that's just how things just developed um, from there. Um, and I realized the limitations very quickly um, from where I was. And then I moved into a, into a doctor's office because I was really looking for that leverage and for that credibility factor. And that was, that was really great. And, and just how things happened, I, I have my own practice space now and I do mostly in-person sessions. But my focus is going to be in the future more about really um, helping other Reiki practitioners who want to build a business um, do it sustainably. Because again, of these challenges, you know, with insurance and, and with you know um, um, the legalities of it, right? And and, and just, just things like you know having a business account and getting a you know tax ID number and all these kind of things. Nobody gives us a manual for this, how to communicate with clients, how to manage the expectations. That, that is also something that you only learn on the fly. <laughs> no, that, that is a good point because obviously sessions or teaching is our product to put in a code mark because obviously it's, it's a different kind of product. But I think one part we don't realize when we're like saying, oh, I'm gonna give sessions, charge so much a month, and then I'm gonna leave Perfect. And then you realize, oh, there are taxes, there is like the rooms, there is marketing. So one thing I think you three are really good at marketing. And some I don't know if Parita, you also like you're really good at doing websites. You so you have a very like 360 approach to this. So I don't know if you want to talk a little bit of like on the importance of the one thing that made a big difference when you started, for example, and the big as Andrea said, like the big aha 
oh, I need insurance, oh, I need this. Is there any other thing that people should take into consideration when they're like, that's it, I quit my job and I'm starting uh, my Reiki business. Like one big, like, you better have an Instagram account or you better like have an Excel sheet where you keep your money. Yeah, I think that's all really great advice. Keeping it organized somewhere is important um, because you want to know what your actually income is versus what you're paying out for the advertising or the insurance or whatever it may be. So having it organized somewhere is really important. And I think it also comes down to, are you having a practice that's in person, primarily in person, or are you developing a practice that you want to have online? And I think there's benefits and you know struggles with each, but I, I do feel like building an in-person practice is incredibly easier <laughs> than to build an online practice. And so really, um, really having, make, making that decision, if you're doing a little bit of both or you're because it all comes down to trust and relationships. I think that to me is like the biggest thing. And so where are you going to be building relationships with potential clients? So networking is really important. Getting over the, um, I'm not the imposter syndrome of, I think that's a huge one. Like when we can set that aside or your, you know, quote unquote, witch's wound of like, if I talk about who I am, I'm going to be, I'm someone's going to, you know, talk against me or bad mouth me. And so once we can just accept who we are a hundred percent fully, I am a Reiki teacher. I am a Reiki practitioner. I stand in my truth. I stand in my power of who I am. And then you start networking. And I think that, I mean, it comes then once again, you have to heal yourself first. You have to fully love and honor and accept who you are. And then you share that, you share that light from that perspective and you're going to start attracting people. So whether you're in an expo or farmer's market, or you're, you're doing the, the event at the library or wherever it is, it all comes down to building relationships. And so if you have a hard time in those departments, those are things that you need to work on first. Oh yeah. I couldn't agree with you more. You know, for me, the biggest thing that, that, you know, as Reiki practitioners who want to start out, what they need to know is they need to know who they are and they really need to be in integrity with themselves and with their practice and also, and with their understanding of Reiki, because when you start out and you have a business and then all of a sudden you have rent to pay, you have insurance to pay, right? And all of a sudden you have these expenses, but you don't have the clients coming in. What I have observed Observed is that many people compromise and many people tell clients what they want or what they want to hear or start using things that are attractive to the client but um, may not be um, you know in integrity to the way they practice or were taught reiki and that's and i think that's that's a big that's a big issue completely mm -hmm. agree that that is a good one and i think it's a fine balance like you need to make your business your own, but you also need to respect the practice, right? So I remember once when I had a mentor, New York gives you free business mentor. It's an amazing, in that sense. And she saw my website, it's like, why are you different from a hundred Reiki teachers or practitioners? I'm like, I don't know, I'm different because of this and that. It's not on your website. Why are you offering sessions and classes like everybody else? What makes you different, right? And I think that line of like, how do you make a business your own? respecting the integrity of the practice is something that, again, as you all ladies said, there is no manual, but mm -hmm. I think the three of you have been able to do, right? Very true to your rules. And I would love, Parita, because you actually have been created content that is very respectful of the practice, but is also a little bit very new and fresh. So what is your point of view? How did you make a little bit the business your own? Yeah, I, I realized that it's uh, really important to um, also get clear on what you want to offer. Um, I, I think in the beginning, I had this idea that Reiki practitioners, we just do sessions. And, um, you know, quickly I realized that there's so many ways in which you can serve people and also so many ways in which you can make money. And um, now I look around and I see that we're all doing it differently. I, I don't think that... Um, anyone has the same exact business plan. Um, some of us are doing podcasts and blogs and affiliate marketing courses, trainings, like some online, some in person, 
I mean, retreat, there, there's like endless options of how you want to reach people and how you want to make a living. And um, so it, it's really important to tune in and see, you know, how much um, time can you give to the business? Um, you know, what, how much energy you also have for the practice and, um, and get clear on, you know, what your boundaries are. Like, do you have it in you to plan a retreat or would you like, do you have it to do a training right now? How many sessions a week are you capable of? I think that's something that can really vary from one person to the next. Um, and, and it also evolves over time. Um, I think that we're constantly evolving as practitioners and um, so our, our needs and our dreams are also changing over time. I love what you bring is integrity of the practice and integrity of who we are and the person we're becoming, right? So, and for me, that's the thing. Reiki business is not very real business. This, like the business per se is a spiritual practice, right? The fear of not making the money. Uh, what do we compromise? How do we evolve, right? Sometimes we keep the same business models for 10 years because like that's what we know, but we're changing as practitioners. So I think this is really incredible. And I would love for you to share perhaps a vulnerable moment I usually call them oops in the interviews when people are teaching, but I think this is probably more valuable to offer one moment where you were very vulnerable with your business, but actually being vulnerable gave you a big lesson that made your business better. If you feel comfortable, like I'm very open with my vulnerable moments, but please like you don't need to share if like something feels too personal. You know, for me, it was really just like getting very clear and then getting the courage to say, I am not a healer um, and, and, and to turn clients away and, and to say and to be able to say, I am sorry, but I cannot help you. You need to go to the ER. I literally said this to a client. <laughs> um, I am constantly also referring people to therapists, you know, psychotherapists or um, to or to doctors, because um, just to really make sure that the boundaries again, and and just and also you know, knowing, you know, I would love to help you, but I am not the person to do that. Oh, I love that so much because I think. That's also like, I'm really clear on what my scope of practice is. Mm -hmm. I know what I can handle and what I can't. And I tend to have people who come in who are suicidal or, you know, having severe mental health issues. And always my first question is, is do you have a counselor? Are you working with other healthcare practitioners that are actually meant to help in that scope of practice? And if they're, if they are not, then I will turn them away too. And I think that's a really, um, as we're trying to grow our business to be in, a, in alignment with that going, you know, this is not something that, um, I can do that. It's just not, it's not in my scope. Like I, I really, I'm more than happy to work with people who have a team of professionals working with them. And that's what I try to cultivate is like, I'm working with these therapists and these doctors, and we send each other clients back and forth. And then you're, you're collaborating with other healthcare professionals. And in that you're one, you're growing your business. And two, you're still staying in your own integrity of like, this is what I provide. This is what Reiki actually offers. It's not the end all be all to all health conditions. <laughs> yes. The magic one session fix. <laughs> Hey, we all been through that <laughs> and to the letdown after when people is like, I'm still me. Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. Kind of adding to that idea. I think that um, uh, I sometimes get uh, calls from people who are like, can you break a spell for me? Or, you know, can you work? Can you help me get back together with an ex? Um, can you do Reiki on someone else for me? Right. And so I think it, it um, takes a lot of honesty there to, to just like, you know, set the, um, kind of give them more information on what Reiki actually is, what we can and cannot do, and also how, how we cannot work on others without their consent. Um, but I think something else that also um, maybe left me a little bit vulnerable in the beginning um, and something that I've like learned through was 
uh, just figuring out like financial boundaries, like how much am I willing to compromise when someone can't afford a session and how can I support them in other ways while not giving away, you know, so much of my time for free. Um, and I think I've learned over the years like um, that, you know, I can still support people with my writing or with some free meditations or, um, you know, once in a while I do throw some free events, but I don't have to, um, and I can have a sliding scale for um, sessions, but I don't have to completely discount it because someone's going through a tough time. I can still support them um, in other ways. I think that is such an important subject. And I think that theme became really important during the pandemic, right? Like, I don't know if it happened to all of you, but I got so many people saying, I'm depressed, you need to give me sessions for free. Like, well, if I did that, I would basically, like I got 20 emails a day. And, but that's why I created my morning meditation because you want to give that support. And, but on the other hand, like you also run a business, you have a life and you need to keep that balance, right? Uh, so I'm, I love that you brought this subject. How have you, like perhaps Christina, Andrea, managed this expectation when people go through a rough time or during the pandemic, perhaps also our business evolved? How do we put boundaries and deal with the financial aspect? Yeah, no, I love this. Um, so for, for what we do at Reiki Cafe University, so I moved from like in-person sessions like I was seeing 15 to 20 clients a week. I had a very full practice to apprentices teaching every month, like, and then the pandemic hit and everything was like, okay, and now we're moving online. And luckily I had already the plan in place to move things online. I, the, the website literally got finished the month before the, the lockdown hit. And so I was already ahead of the game, ready to switch to online programs and really, um, making, you know, really focusing on supporting Reiki practitioners versus just the general population. So knowing that like when the pandemic hit, I really like to have a variety of different pieces that people can pay into. So there is the freebie, but the freebie, the freebie is in exchange for their email. You know, I want to grow my email list. And so, yes, here's my free meditation or here's my eight day chakra foundation activation series or whatever it is. And there's, so there's a freebie, but then there's also little bite size courses or programs so that if they want a little bit more, they can do the 14 day Reiki reawakening series for $11, or they can take the beginner's guide to gain new Reiki clients for $37. So there's like little bite size and then you have your something in the $200 range. And then I have my bigger programs, which are typically between five and seven months. And those are in the, you know, multiple thousand dollars range. And so I feel like I'm serving different populations with different needs. And then when it comes to the bigger programs, I sometimes, depending on the client and what they're capable of, I'll offer what I call flowy invoicing. So it really matches where the client, where the student is in the business of like, well, some months I make this much money and some months I make that much money, you know, like we're all in that range and flow with our businesses, depending on the season or whatever it may be. And so they can literally have their full invoice and pay what they can as they go and have an extended payment plan. So the payment plan might be 12 or 18 months, but the program is only five to seven months. So I try to accommodate that way. And that way I feel like I'm making the money that I need to make to survive in the, and the pandemic and having to switch my business all over and also meeting the needs of my clients and, and my students so that they can, they can get the information that they can. And that's with the blogs and the podcasts and all of those things too. I love that. And it's funny because in Japanese Reiki it's all a balance of firm and flexible, right? And that's what I'm hearing from all of you ladies. Who was it for you, Andrea? Who is that part of handling? Yes, I'm very firm now with the in-person sessions. That is also, you know, to protect, you know, my, um, you know, my boundaries. Um, and also, so I'm get very selective of, you know, who gets to work with me in person. Also, my teaching is going to go in this way too, because I really want to build, um, you know, an apprenticeship system. So also, you know, to guide practitioners on their journey. Um, 
to and then so that they also can then um, support them um, in person clients but you know for the public and just to make myself available I still give back to the community by doing those library programs <laughs> I'm, I'm so grateful for them this is just how they started you know it's you know it's a mindful Monday here or there it's a lunchtime meditation so that that really provides access and provides people the tools because for me the biggest thing is you know to always provide tools and value that people can take and um, apply into their everyday life. So I make sure that my newsletter and my blog always offers something that they can take away um, and that they really have some, you know, something, you know, some very breathing guidance or just some, something to think about just to help them redirect their focus um, so that they can help themselves. But I, for me, it took a while um, to really learn, you know, I'm not here to help everybody. And, and also pricing uh, plays a big role um, because um, when I started out and I didn't know about pricing, um, it attracted a whole different kind of a clientele that was not good for me. And, and you know, um, the more established I got and the more secure I got in my pricing, so that has a natural... <laughs> A natural selective factor, um, which which needs which needs to happen, um, I believe, because it is because again, it's it, it needs to be a credible business and it needs to be a credible practice, and a lot of practitioners they they need to be aware of those boundaries and just like you said, Christine, you know, it's it's so important. Um, and on Parita for, for having this clarity for ourselves. What do we need? How can we take care of ourselves? Provide ourselves? How much energy do we have? And 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 then and then just like and how can we find that balance for ourselves i feel like there's so much around like the professionalism of reiki practitioners when you do set those boundaries and you have a practice outside of your home and it really is benefiting the reiki community to establish it as professional and I, I, I do, I recommend that so much. Like don't work out of your house. Don't give all of your sessions away for free. Um, be very mindful of your sliding scales and know that if you do have a freebie or you have something that's a lower price, such as a meditation Monday opportunity that people can donate into, that you're sprinkling seeds, you're, you're planting the seeds that even if they can't afford sessions right now, doesn't mean that they aren't going to remember in six months and hire you then or a year from now or whenever it is. And I remember hanging cards all over the city and hanging up the flyers and doing all of those things. And I remember getting a client and he's like, I had your business card on my fridge for the last six months. And I look at it every day. I wonder if today was going to be the day to call you. And he finally did. And he ended up not only coming in for probably a dozen or two dozen sessions, but he's taken all of the Reiki classes. He came in on as my apprentice. He is just taking in that information at, at any angle he can. And, and I, and this is my point. It's like, it's okay to sprinkle the information out there and hold your boundaries because if it's meant for them, they will come. I love that. It's, I'm, I'm hearing words I love, like, you know, patience comes, honesty, integrity, clarity, boundaries. And in whatever subject or angle we go about the business, those are the qualities that I still hear from you. Um, but I also love that concept of sprinkling the seed because I think Reiki practice is also a seed and it keeps on evolving, right? So talking a little bit about patience and Parita, I know, for example, you use your writing in a very wise way as well. So how's that, because that has been also planting seeds, right? All the writing, how has it like worked for you uh, to write articles or to really use like the writing medium to, to build your business? Yeah, so it's funny that you mentioned that because um, yes, when the, when the pandemic hit, um, I was seeing clients in New York City and Long Island, but also virtually. And then I shifted to just virtually. Um, and so uh, I had to shift my marketing a bit and uh, having the blogs there from a few years prior to that definitely helped me to um, call in the clients that I needed to, you know, sustain um, myself. And um, I, I enjoy the writing because it, it also is healing for me um, when I start expressing myself and I start putting the thoughts down. Um, it helps me to solidify what I've always felt and what I've always known. And it just forces me to reflect and get clear on what I truly believe. 
So it's like personally healing. It's a part of my spiritual practice, but then I think it also just helps people who are going through the same thing, or maybe they, they have questions, or they, you know, they might have taken different training that doesn't cover what I'm bringing up, or maybe they've heard the same concept like 10 times before, but it's just a reminder for them and they're hearing it for the 11th time. But um, I think it's nice to have some content that you put out into the world um, that really expresses like who you are, what you believe in. And that just helps us to draw in and magnetize the people that really want to work with you or the people who um, resonate with what you have to say. Um, and, and I think it's nice because people can get to know you before they invest in a session with you or a course. And uh, so they're, they're getting this opportunity to see if you're the right fit. And that always ends up working better for us too, because then we're not you know, attracting in the people who are not ready for Reiki or ready for the kind of work that you're doing. And that's another thing I'm hearing from all of you. Like at the beginning, we started one every client, right? I probably learned the hard way, like most of us do, that no, you actually need to really close your demographic to the people who are right for you. And there's and that's the way there is no competition, Reiki, because we're all very different. So a little bit, how did God, I lost my head. Like today I'm like a little bit like all of that. But like, how did you? How, what helped you let go of the need to please everybody? Like, what was the moment or the thing that helped you like, okay, I need to quit, you know? And what would you advise people to be able to make that jump? Because I was having a conversation yesterday with someone and there was a big, big fear of letting go of a big audience to really go down to a smaller audience. Uh, in my case, the people who are smaller audience are happy to invest in me. So that's why, like, from experience, I know that it works because when people come to me, they're like non-negotiating prices, they're really happy and they go for longer trainings or teachings or sessions. Uh, but what, how was that? Uh, if you had an advice to tell people like how to do this or one thing, like, don't be afraid because this, what would that be? I, uh, here's my take. I feel like you have to really understand what your zone of genius is or your zone of magic or what really turns you on and what you constantly can stay excited about. So if there is a demographic that is like, I don't want to have another client like that, then just pay attention to that. Like pay attention to that, pay attention to what really excites you, what really, um, lights you up and follow that because then when you start having blogs around that or if you start advertising and using that language you're going to then attract the people who resonate with it so it's not really saying necessarily no to the people it's just they're going to automatically be attracted to your energy by you really shining your own light and your own truth and who you are and so it's going to be a natural selection process versus like I don't see this type of client or I don't see this kind of a client. And it's very different. Like I live in a very rural town compared to you guys who are in New York city. Like when you only have 35,000 people in town, I, I didn't really want to say no to anyone. Right. And I was really the only Reiki practitioner in town. Now the town is full of Reiki practitioners because they're most of them are my students, <laughs> which is fantastic. And so one, I've released that, you know, there is no competition. I'm because I get to stay in my zone of genius. And this is who I like to work with. And I'm really honoring all of those other practitioners town who they have their own niche and they have their own like what they specialize in. And so we can all honor each other. And so there's less, you know, conflict, but really it comes back to like, just be you, be true to you and speak to that and put that out there, put that energy out there and you're going to get the right clients for you. Okay. So that's the foundation. 
go ahead. Yeah, that's the foundation. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, that's the foundation. That's what it has to be, you know? And it's just like, you know, speaking, it's about speaking the same language, right? Because I don't want to twist and turn and just like, you know, so that I can placate or please the client, you know, and talk in their terms. You know, we have to speak the same language. We need to have the same foundation. And for me, the biggest thing, because I'm very big on self-discipline, on, on self-responsibility. So that's also the kind of clients that come to me because they appreciate this approach. Um, and again, it comes down to being yourself um, because it's the only way to be. <laughs> I think I have a bit of an unpopular uh, opinion on this, but um, I feel like there's kind of a lot of pressure these days to niche down. And uh, um, I think that sometimes, um, you, first of all, I don't think many people can figure out what their niche is before they get started. It's something that you just have to um, you, you kind of get started on your journey, you see practitioner, uh, sorry, you see clients and um, you teach students and, and, you know, over time you might decide that you want to niche down and you want to work with a certain group of period, people, but um, you might also decide that you want to see all sorts of people and um, I personally just see uh, uh, clients who want to receive Reiki for all sorts of different reasons and um, it's been working all right. Like I, I enjoy working with people with different backgrounds and um, some people want to heal just from physical health issues and some people have a long history of maybe mental or emotional distress. Um, some people are just curious. They just want to try it out. They, they're not, they don't have expectations. Um, some people want to develop a spiritual practice and it's nice to be able to see how Reiki can support so many different people on um, different paths and, and I don't have to confine myself to a smaller demographic. Yeah, and I think that really makes a lot of sense if you have an in-person practice. When you have a, you know, just by your location alone, that is already niching, niching down versus when you are online, um, then that's when the pressure is on. <laughs> that's when the pressure is on, like you have to niche down because now your competition isn't just the 10 Reiki practitioners in your area. It's the, you know, thousands of Reiki practitioners who are trying to grab your attention online. And so when you are the Reiki practitioner that only works with moms or the Reiki practitioner that only works with other Reiki practitioners or the Reiki practitioner that works only with kids or the Reiki practitioner that only works with cancer patients, like then it makes more sense to niche down if you're really working in the online space. But I think it's um, online is much more difficult because you need, it takes a few years to build up an audience to even be seen online. Um, and not that you need a huge audience, but there's definitely techniques to really um, angle yourself in the online space so that you can be found. And so that's when the niching really feels more, um, more important. So I think it's for me, like, you know, it comes back to what you were all saying, be true to who you are, right? So at the end, online or in person, in person, if you enjoy working with many, many people, then as you said, just in person, the city will do the niche. If you're online, again, you probably may start trying to attract everybody. If that's your personality, it may also be very attractive. But for most of us, we evolve and we like, we discover we like something, right? So I think at the end, it comes back to who we are and respecting our taste and experience because we're all going to be very different. Uh, in my case, it's like life took me where I like enjoy it most and I took the decision, I'm going to do what I enjoy most, right? So we all have different approaches, but as long as they are true and we can be joyful in our practice, I think it's great. So I wanted to close these with one question and I don't know if you have ever felt this, but I felt imposter syndrome. Um, Sometimes in my Reiki business, sometimes honestly in my daily life as well, in my writing, in my asking, everything. Uh, I've been very good at ignoring it. I keep on going forward, right? But I don't know if you, I know a lot of Reiki practitioners also have the imposter syndrome, right? So what is perhaps one advice you will give someone who's going through imposter syndrome as they build a Reiki business? I'll kick this one off. Um, I feel like 
if you can align to your future self, your future identity of who you are. So if you are wanting to have that full-time Reiki practice, taking time in your Reiki meditations to really envision who that version of yourself is and how she may act. Meaning if she's doing the blog or she's doing a podcast or she's doing the free event at the farmer's market or whatever it may be, just really aligning to the identity of who you want to become. Because when we can envision it and really call it forth, then we lose some of the fear because you're identifying into your power, into your success. And when you can focus on that version versus focusing on the past and the fears and what didn't work, we're constantly being pulled forward into that future envisioning. And that can really help settle down the imposter syndrome because we know that even if I'm not experiencing the success right now, my vision is that I'm going to be, my vision is that two years from now, I have a full-time practice or six months from now, I've got five clients a week or whatever, whatever the goal is. So I'm very future oriented. And that really helps me release the fear of like, I shouldn't be doing this. I'm not good enough to do this because I know I'm going to be. And if I can know that in my essence of who I am, then, then it helps it release. And I keep taking those steps forward. I keep trying and doing the new things that scare me because I know eventually I'm going to be embodying that success. I realized that um, imposter syndrome is something that I think you have to just go out there and take the baby steps. And as you do that one thing more and more, it just becomes um, more natural. It becomes easier. And um, I've also gained a lot of confidence in um, like from my clients, when, when they give me feedback and they tell me how much, you know, the, the practice is helping them or how much one session makes a difference. That's really how I learned that Reiki was like deeply impactful because when I was practicing on myself, I think I, I wasn't um, realizing how much of a difference it was making because um, every day I would see a bit of a subtle shift. And over time, I wasn't acknowledging um, just how powerful it was in all areas of my life. And I had gotten to a point where, um, you know, I was getting all the signs that I needed to um, practice uh, professionally. And um, I also had deep motivation to help people, but I, I didn't think that Reiki could be that impactful. And um, I, I just put myself out there and I offered some um, like free, yeah, practically free online um, sessions to people that I didn't know. And um, I had just told myself like, what's the worst that can happen? They might not feel anything, but it's, it's practically free for them. And um if just from the first few sessions, I realized like, the, you know, this is so real, this is deeply impactful. And, um, and so I, I would just encourage people to like start somewhere. If even if you're not ready for a session, you know, some people might be drawn towards an event or um, a creating content. And if you're not ready for like three platforms, start with just one platform. And um yeah, start with some baby stuff. So, and just the feedback that you get from people and from interacting with others is deeply helpful in overcoming that. Yeah. I think, you know, with imposter syndrome, it has a function, you know, and the fear and the anxiety has a function and it shows me that I care about something and that I want to do a good job. And so, for me, the approach is just showing up always shines, you know, taking imperfect action. And, and but at the same time, you know, having the necessities in place, like I said, like the insurance, like the client intake form, and, and these kind of things before being unleashed into, into the world. And just for me, and as I just advance and I grow, it's just like, for me, it's just like, what would a professional Reiki practice look like for me. Um, and, and for me, that's a high standard of professionalism. And that's that's why um, I have my own checklist that I follow, but it gives me a sense of safety and security because I feel that I have done everything 
but according to the knowledge that I have at this moment of time that I could do. I, I love that. So for me, it's funny, like for me, it's, it has a little bit with all of what you said, right? Like it's practice, practice, practice. So really having a strong self-practice so that I know I did my homework, which is a little bit like your checklist, right, Andrea? Mm -hmm. And then that is the way I let go. Like if I practice, if I study, if I act from what I know to be true from my practice, but I'm also very open-minded to evolve and change, that for me takes away the fear. I start with baby steps, like Parita, I always recommend my students, like if you wanna go professional, keep sessions at the beginning, like before you go professional officially, practice at least 40, 50 hours. Like I will never recommend someone to finish a Reiki two and go into business, right? Because you need to know how to handle people, their expectations, their reactions. And then the part where I was very, very bad at prepare the insurance, the stuff, because I'm, like, I'm more of a creative person, right? So have the checklist of what you need. And then that part of also like, don't be open to evolve in the future, right? Don't get stuck with what you think your Reiki business is. Keep evolving, keep changing. And so that combination of your three advice I think is like priceless. And, and also reminding people, this is a practice and the business is part of the practice as well, right? Do not worry, do not anger, be grateful, and especially show compassion to yourself and others. The practice diligently is gonna happen if you have a business anyway, you're not gonna sleep. Uh, no, I'm exaggerating, but, uh, but I think, I wanna thank you all so much. So I will be including all of your links uh, for people who are watching this or listening to this on the podcast to reach out to you. And you all have wonderful offers, services. You're all very different. So I think if they check you all out, they will get a very good feeling about what you offer. And I think you can help so many people. One thing I'm grateful, when I studied Reiki uh, 15, 16 years ago, none of this was available. Most people will not. I had a manual with a couple of pages, like this is how you said the uh, Reiki business. And honestly, now I think I should find the manual and give it away just to laugh at it, right? Because it was so not, it was like, put a massage table, get clients, do session, charge. I'm like, okay, no. So I really encourage people to reach out to you or to reach out to other people who have had a business. There are a lot of business training right now. There are a lot of guidance and mentoring apprenticeships, right? So different ways that you can start that is easier. And I, you all have said it, go slowly, baby step, build your business. Don't just quit your job without a plan of savings. Just this is at the end, a professional path. And we even say like, it's a professional Reiki practitioner, right? So there is a profession, it's not as easy as it seems, but it's also not as impossible as it seems. So that middle path. Any final words uh, before we say goodbye? You're all looking at me like, I don't know. <laughs> have fun, like that's part of it. Don't take yourself too seriously and have fun and part of the process. Treat it like a business and ask for help. <laughs> Love that. And uh, also just come back to the precepts. I think that sometimes uh, working on our worries and um, also being kind to ourselves um, and yeah, just living into the precepts can help in, in the process because it is, uh, it, it's, it's a process and it, you know, the businesses don't build overnight. So um, like, yeah, live into your practice while you're building the professional practice. Thank you so, so much to all of you. Again, the links will be on the notes for the podcast. My heart, like I'm so thankful. And Christine, hopefully one day you'll come to New York and we'll get all together. Uh, it was a very East Coast oriented podcast today. You are like the one who's balancing the geography. So we hope to meet you and wishing you a very, very happy rest of the day, evening, morning, whenever you're watching this. Ladies, thank you so much. Mm -hmm.